Thank you very much, Professor Edward Bulmer, for giving me the pleasure of this interview for Vitalstoff blog. The audience, readers and listeners know that this is a site in German where they can find access information on what I call holistic health, integrative health. So this is mainly paraphrasing it as scientific evidence as much as possible with a wider approach than just what unquote mainstream science. And I am happy that you agreed to this interview to speak about your book, The Inflamed Mind. It's It's been a very fascinating read. It's going to be published in German in March. The, the, the title will be Die Entzündete Seele, which is a literal translation of the title, so The Inflamed Mind. You are head of the Department of Psychiatry at Cambridge University, and this also is an indication of the high quality of your work. Could you, or could we maybe start by you giving us some uh, understanding of what brought you into into the medical field in the first place? Have you always wanted to be a doctor um, or researcher? Or how was your path into this? Uh, so thank you. Yes, I I started with an interest in science, really, um, particularly biology and chemistry. And in the English educational system at the time, uh, you had to make a decision about, you know, your professional career quite early. Uh, I think I was sort of 16 or 17 when I had to make a decision. And I I thought I, I, I wanted to do science, but I wanted to do science in a way that was, you know, relevant directly relevant to to people um, and of course that that leads you to medicine so i started my medical training i guess when i was 18 or 19 i was i went to oxford uh university i did the i did the first part of my medical training there and then i moved to london to a teaching hospital called st bartholomew's hospital which is a, a very old hospital on the outskirts of that way it was on the outskirts of london when it was founded sometime in the 12th century it's now right in the heart of london i i did my i completed my medical training there then i did a bit more work as a junior doctor i, I did some further training as a physician until i was about 30 and then i switched to training in psychiatry and i've, I've been in psychiatry since then i'm now 58 so you know, most of my uh, professional life, I have been in psychiatry uh, and neuroscience, but uh, I did, I guess, about 10 years of uh, preliminary work on uh, on medical training and, and uh, postgraduate work as a physician before then. Thank you. Maybe to, to get a firm platform from where we start this discussion is, could you give us a, a brief definition or explanation? What is depression? What does the reader learn about this condition from your book? What is depression um, to start with? Mm. Well, you know, depression is, first of all, it's a personal experience. It's not very easily defined objectively. So if you look in the psychiatric textbooks and you ask the question, you know, how is how is depression formally defined? It's in terms of symptoms that the patients may experience and report to their their uh, healthcare practitioners. For example, low mood, you know, feeling depressed, feeling blue, feeling despondent, a loss of capacity for pleasure, uh, which is in the jargon also called anhedonia, is very characteristic. Depressed people don't find pleasure in the things that would normally be rewarding to them. There's often cognitive symptoms that people may find themselves thinking about in, in a guilty way about things that they might have done wrong or feel that they've done wrong in the past. They may feel more pessimistic about the future than they normally would. There's a strong tendency to be self-critical and that can turn into self-harming behaviors or in, in extreme cases, suicidal uh, acts. So there's a lot of cognitive components to it as well as a lot of emotional components to it. 
And we've always known that there are some more bodily aspects to depression. Some of these are sometimes called vegetative symptoms, which I don't think is a very helpful term, but that's one of the ways that it talked about uh, in the literature. That's symptoms like disturbed sleep, disturbed appetite, low levels of energy, low levels of sexual energy or interest. So it's a syndrome, depression. It's not a disease in the same way that, for example, tuberculosis is a disease where you know every patient with tuberculosis has been infected with the same germ, the same bacterium, the same root cause is at the bottom of every case of tuberculosis. That's what in medical parlance we would call a disease or a disease entity. Depression isn't currently understood in that way. It's understood more as a syndrome, a collection of symptoms that co-occurs quite frequently with those kind of cognitive, emotional and more bodily aspects that I just summarized. And it is a collective of symptoms which is on the rise if we look at it from a from a general perspective. So are we becoming more depressed or, or is this just a way of looking at it and being more aware or more aware? What would be your yeah your take on this? I think that's uh, an interesting question. And I personally think that depression has always been very common. I mean, if you if you look back to some of the work that you know was done, you know, ten, twenty, thirty years ago, looking at the the prevalence of depression in the population, we've always known it was very common. I mean, the lifetime risk of a major depressive disorder is about one in four. So you know, one in four of us at some point in our lives will have an experience that amounts to a, a clinical diagnosis of depression. And we've known that for a long time. We've also known for a very long time that if you look at the causes of disability, particularly in relatively developed economies like Germany, UK, USA, depression is right up there at the top, um, you know, top one or two or three causes of medical disability with absolutely enormous economic costs, as well as all the personal and, and, and social costs of depression, the economic costs are enormous. In the book, uh, for example, I talk about the economic costs of depression to the UK are roughly equivalent to a percentage point of our gross domestic product. You know, it's actually quite a significant chunk of the total economic activity of a country like the UK is discounted because of the disability associated with depression. So, These data, the epidemiological data, the economic data, they're telling us that this is a very, very common problem. So it's possible that it's becoming even more common, but I think it's more likely that we are going through a phase where people are feeling bolder about talking about depression. I mean, I think one of the issues around depression and mental health generally is the issue of stigma and of shame. And I think a lot of people historically have felt ashamed to experience these symptoms and perhaps have been you know less inclined to talk about them so maybe the the public visibility of depression has been a little bit under the radar if you will compared to the real prevalence of depression in, in our societies so short answer to your question i think depression is very common i think it always has been and i think probably what we're seeing now is not so much a further increase in the real rates of depression, but a very welcome increase in the sort of acceptability of talking about depression. I understand. Roughly 30 years ago, so we're now 2019 and the start of the 1990s, there seemed to have been a time when there was a lot of excitation and optimism about having gotten to the root cause of depression and being able to to treat this condition so this this was the time when Prozac was introduced and, and made a cover on Time magazine I uh, mm-hmm. I remember since then the mood has cooled down a bit in in this conventional approach um, would you agree 
Yes, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I think there was um, uh, there was a period I think of great optimism about understanding and treatment of depression, which which actually probably goes back to the 1950s. And there's a, the story I tell in the book, which I think is one of the most sort of extraordinary stories. Really, is the 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 story of how the first antidepressants were discovered, the first antidepressant drugs were discovered. Which was completely by accident, you know. In it, the story is that uh, back in the 1950s, tuberculosis was a big killer, and mm. the city of New York built a, a hospital uh, called Seaview Hospital, which was out on uh, Staten Island, away from the main city, and that's where all the patients with tuberculosis were were essentially quarantined. There was no real treatment. But they were just uh, kept there, and I think the hope was that the the view of the ocean, the fresh air, would somehow uh, help them recover. And then, you know, people began to develop antibiotic drugs that would work for tuberculosis. And one of the first drugs to go into a clinical trial in the Seaview Hospital was a drug called ipronizid. And you know, it, it, that was a very successful trial in two ways. One is the the drug was an effective antibiotic, and it 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 helped people recover from infection with tuberculosis, which was the expected benefit. But there was also an unexpected benefit, which is that many of these patients became much happier quite quickly. You know, there was a sort of an outbreak of euphoria in this hospital as the as the trial progressed, and. In fact, Life magazine went and did a photo story in Seaview Hospital and headlined it, Dancing in the Wards. And, you know, there were these fabulous photos of patients dancing with nurses and covered in smiles. They felt so good about the treatment they were, they were getting. And well, some of the psychiatrists in New York at the time thought, well, that's very interesting. I wonder why Ipronizid is making people feel happier. And... So people looked in more detail at what ipronizid was doing biochemically, and it was discovered that it was a drug that boosted levels of adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine um, in the brain. And these were, you know, the uh, again, this is all, it's all very sort of historically conditioned. The whole story: those molecules, adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, had just been discovered as as neurotransmitters, in, in other words, as key signaling molecules for communication between cells in in the brain. So people thought, well, that's very interesting. This this drug that makes people happier in a TB hospital has a, a sort of boosting effect on these neurotransmitters when we look at it in the laboratory. Maybe we could find a use for ipronazid and for other drugs that boost Adrenaline, noradrenaline, and dopamine. Maybe we could we could use those drugs as antidepressants more generally, not just for patients that have got TB. And that all happened quite quickly, within about you know a decade of you know Ipronizid going into that clinical trial for for tuberculosis. There were uh, I guess about uh, five to ten antidepressant drugs on the market for depression, and all of them had the same kind of biochemical property in common. They all boosted noradrenaline, dopamine, adrenaline levels in the brain. And that was really a, a moment, obviously, of high excitement. I mean, I wasn't in psychiatry at the time, of course. This was kind of like, uh, you know, early 1960s, really. But when you look back, you can see the excitement. People obviously thought, we've got treatments that are really going to deal with this issue of depression once and for all. And I think people also thought we've now got some understanding in how where depression comes from because if we can make people less depressed by giving them drugs that boost the levels of adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, maybe the reason they were depressed in the first place is because the levels of those transmitters were rather low. So you've got a kind of way of thinking there about the cause of depression which comes from having discovered quite by accident a way of treating depression. And, you know, that was obviously very exciting. Lots of academics and lots of drug companies 
got involved in the area. There was development of new and better drugs, particularly for boosting serotonin. And that really culminated in the launch of Prozac in 1990, which was, you know, heralded as a great advance in terms of the treatment of depression. It's an extraordinary story because it has resulted in effective drugs. I mean, these, these, these drugs that I'm talking about, you know, amitriptyline, uh, sertraline, duloxetine, many others, we can see that they are all effective. On average, they work, you know, moderately well as antidepressants. But I think what, and that's, you know, that's an enduring benefit, I think, to the world. But what hasn't really stood the test of time so well is the explanation for how these drugs work or for where depression comes from in the first place. Because despite a lot of effort, it has proven to be very difficult to prove that people with depression have low levels of serotonin or adrenaline or dopamine before they're treated with antidepressant drugs. So the way I would sum it up is that, you know, between 19... 55, let's say, and 1990, we had 35 years of real therapeutic progress, enduring therapeutic progress, which gave us new drugs that continue to work moderately well to this day. But we never really understood why they worked or how they worked. And we've never really had a very good a way of predicting which patients are going to respond most to those treatments. So it's kind of a, a story that's, as I say, given us therapeutic advances without necessarily a very deep understanding of how those drugs work. And I think that is why, in my view, progress has stalled in more recent times. If you look from 1990 to where we are now, 2019, that's another 30-year stretch. And there really have been no major new drug treatments come forward for depression in that time. So you've had a you know, burst of intense, prolific therapeutic progress from 1950 roughly to 1990. And then from 1990 to uh, 2019, it's gone quiet. And I think the reason that, it's, it, that we've not seen so much therapeutic progress in the last few years is, is fundamentally because we haven't been very clear about the causes of depression, where it comes from. And I think the next generation of treatment is going to have to focus more on cause and the causal factors. Right. There has even been a time 10 years ago where there was yet more cold water being poured onto the, onto the science community by many, many companies deciding to pull out mm. of funding further mm. research in this area. But you yeah. are to quote a title of one of the chapters of your book, you're daring to think differently with your approach. Maybe this is a good time to shift this focus uh, onto what you have been putting forth in your book, and that is a connection between depression and inflammation. Yeah. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, so I think many of us will know that inflammation and depression tend to go together. In the book, I talk about some of my own experiences, for example, of relatively minor inflammation associated with relatively minor depressive symptoms. For example, I had uh, some work done on my teeth. I had to have a, a root canal operation on one of my teeth, which had become infected. And the day or two after that, I found myself feeling quite gloomy. I didn't really want to talk to anybody. I was I just wanted to lie in bed and ponder in a rather morbid way how long I had left to live. It cleared up quite quickly. It never amounted to an episode of clinical depression, but it was definitely an experience of depressive symptoms associated with the the relatively minor inflammation associated with with an infected tooth. Another experience that I've had, and I think possibly many people have had, is, is around vaccination. You know, we were going on holiday to Africa. I needed to be vaccinated against typhoid. And obviously, the vaccination involves being injected with a form of the typhoid 
bacteria that stimulates an immune response, stimulates an inflammatory reaction. And they told me in the vaccination clinic to expect that I'd feel a bit off color for a couple of days. And indeed I did. I felt a little, again, a little bit gloomy, a, a little bit lacking in energy. Uh, I found it a bit more difficult to focus on what I was supposed to be doing at work. So these were two examples. And I think I emphasize those because I think these are probably, you know, a lot of people would have had similar kinds of experience. Uh, if you widen it out a little bit and say, well, what about people who've got, you know, major inflammatory disorders of the body, like arthritis or psoriasis or inflammatory bowel disease, for example, do they often experience depression? And the answer is yes, they do. Depression, fatigue, something that in English we call brain fog, which is just a sense of people struggling to think clearly about their lives and, and particularly struggling to, to plan for the future. These are all psychological symptoms that are very, very common in people with major inflammatory disorder like arthritis and so on. And then you can ask, well, actually, well, what if you look at the people with clinical depression, with major depressive disorder, who, who don't have a major medical illness like arthritis, is there any evidence that they are inflamed? And, and I think that's been an, you know, an area where the, the science has been building quite rapidly over the last few years. And there's, there's robust evidence that, on average, people with depression have increased levels of inflammatory proteins and inflammatory cells in the circulation, in the blood. They might not know that they're depressed. They might, oh, sorry, they might not know that they're inflamed. They might not have a major sort of medical inflammatory disorder. But if you do the blood tests, uh, you can see that there's an increase on average in people with depression for these inflammatory proteins. So all of these are examples of an association between inflammation and depression, the two things going together. And I honestly think that is very common knowledge. I think what is changing and what I spent a lot of time in the book talking about is the scientific evidence that that association between inflammation and depression is a causal relationship or can be a causal relationship, that inflammation can directly cause depression. And that's a very important sort of logical step to go from there's an association between these two things to there's a causal relationship. That's a very important step because if inflammation is a cause of depression, then it could make sense to treat depression by treating inflammation. And that is the new agenda for drug development that I am interested in, that many other people around the world are interested in. Can we find anti-inflammatory drugs or other anti-inflammatory treatments? It doesn't necessarily have to be drugs. It could be diet. It could be various other ways of intervening to damp down the inflammatory response of the immune system. Could that, that approach provide a new way forward for treatment of depression? And that's what I mean by daring to think differently, because we're not thinking about serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, these molecules in the brain. We're not thinking about them as the primary target of treatment anymore. We're thinking instead about the immune system and inflammation as the primary target. Right, and that's something which I personally find extremely intriguing about your work, your book, to get this thought out into the general public, because as you said, it, it requires more effort in understanding both disease and its causes. But this necessitates, I think, a huge effort in also further research, and, 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 and which is, of course, of huge public interest and concern. So therefore, I'm, I'm very glad we get the opportunity to discussing this for, for the German audience in, in preparation of, of the publication of your book. Professor Bulmer, when you say there is hope in finding new ways for treatment, you're also implying, of course, if I understand correctly, that there could be even more uh, to be gained in terms of prevention, because what becomes clear is that maybe the inflammation 
is a precursor of developing mm-hmm. depression, isn't it? That's right. And, you know, I think that is one of the, you know, that you've, you've touched on one of the ways in which scientists have tried to, to demonstrate that inflammation is a cause of depression because causes come before effects. You know, uh, in general, if inflammation was causal and could directly cause depression, we'd expect to find some evidence that people could be inflamed before they're depressed. And, you know, that's a question that we can look at in data, in studies that have collected data from people at a certain point of time and then followed them up over many years. We can look to see, is there any evidence that people who are inflamed but not depressed at the start of a study like that have a, a greater risk of becoming depressed in the future? And, and, you know, there was one, there are several studies that, in fact, now have been published to show that. But the, the one that I think is particularly startling, at least to my mind, is, a, is one that was done in, uh, in the UK a while ago, where everybody that was born in a particular year, I think it was 1978, in Bristol, which is a city in, in the southwest of England, everybody that was born in Bristol in that year was followed up repeatedly for many years into the future. And, and what they found was that the nine-year-olds who had increased levels of inflammatory protein in their blood had significantly increased risk of depression nine years later at the age of 18. You know, they weren't depressed at the age of nine. They didn't know that they were inflamed at the age of nine, but the blood tests that were done showed that there was slightly increased levels of inflammatory proteins in their circulation. And those kids, nine years later, were significantly more likely to be depressed than the the kids who had not been inflamed at the age of nine. So I think that's an example of what you were saying, that when we think about causal relationships, it's, in, it's interesting to think about precedence. And there is evidence that inflammation can precede depression. I should also say that there's a ton of evidence from animal studies, animal experiments, that is consistent with those data from humans. In other words, if you take a perfectly healthy rat or mouse and you make it inflamed, you, you, uh, you deliberately infect it with a germ or uh, you cause it to be inflamed in some other way, those animals will very typically show a change in behavior that looks a lot like some of the symptoms or signs of depression in humans. The animals will, for example, withdraw from social contact with other, other animals. They'll spend more time resting quietly. They'll become less physically active. They will show some evidence that they no longer find as much pleasure in the things that animals normally enjoy. So for example, rats and mice normally, if you give them a choice between plain water and sweetened water, most animals will normally prefer to drink the sweetened water, presumably because they find it more pleasurable after they've been infected or inflamed. Animals no longer show that preference. They're as happy to drink the plain water as the sweet water. And we think that's because inflammation causes a loss of pleasure or a loss of sensation of pleasure in these animals. I mean, obviously, you can't ask an animal, how are you feeling? Do you feel guilty about your past? Do you feel pessimistic about your future? So animal experiments always, you know, there's always a troubling doubt, I think, in people's minds about the extent to which an animal model of depression is really faithful to the the human experience of depression. But nevertheless, it's very striking and it's very clear and very consistent in the scientific work that's been done so far is that if you make animals inflamed, you change their behavior. And you change their behavior in a way which looks a lot like some of the symptoms of depression in humans. And of course, in animals, uh, you can investigate exactly how that works in in biological detail in a way which is very difficult to do in humans. So, you know, it's much clearer from the animal science that an infection or an inflammation in the body can send a signal into the brain, can change the immune cells in the brain and how they're working, which in turn has effects on the nerve cells, which in turn causes the, the behavioral change of 
for example, you know, loss of pleasure. All of that, that whole sort of sequence of cause and effect relationships has been worked out quite well in, in animals. And I think it's likely to be that there's a, a similar mechanistic sequence of events that explains the causal relationship that we can see in humans between inflammation of the body preceding depressive symptoms emerging later in time. Mm -hmm. Is it, would you say, is it a fair observation to say that a lot of the criticism which is being raised to answer your approach or the approach you are following comes from this gap between the ability of proving that what is true in the animal model also holds true with humans. So we are, we are in a way stuck in a dead end street because for ethical reasons, we cannot do the trials which would be necessary to prove this. We can't do those experiments. Therefore, there is a huge burden on innovative approaches to show or to argue the merit, just the pure merit of uh, looking deeper into this. And I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to bring into the discussion this concept of dogma in the medical profession, medical training. In your book, you show, for example, the Berlin Wall of the psyche, which has been valid for a long time and has mm. also fallen now. Can you explain mm. the idea behind this? You're touching on something that's, I think, very important. And in, to be honest, it's one of the reasons I wrote a book. I mean, most academic scientists don't write books so much as, you know, we write, you know, rather more focused scientific papers. But one of the reasons I wanted to write a book about this is because of what you've just touched on, which is I think there is a dogmatic position in medicine which makes it difficult for people to imagine that there could be a direct link between inflammation and depression. And, uh, you know, to deal with uh, that sort of rather dogmatic position, a book is perhaps a more useful way of kind of exploring some of the issues than a traditional scientific paper. And the argument I make in the book is that basically Western medicine is split between body and mind. That's a very fundamental aspect of how Western medicine is organized. And and I argue in the book, and this isn't a particularly original argument, but I, I rehearse the argument in the book, that that really goes back quite a long way to the philosophy of Descartes, you know, who was this marvelous genius, mathematician, philosopher, scientist, who was active particularly, you know, in the early 1600s, so 17th century, about 400 years ago, And he articulated a philosophy that in English we call dualism, which is the idea that a human is really made up of two parts. There's a body, which is essentially a machine, a biological machine that obeys the laws of physics and that we can understand in terms of atoms and molecules and, and biological machinery. And there's a mind. Well, actually, when Descartes was talking about it, it was a spirit. It was a soul that he was talking about. And his idea was that the soul, or as we would say now, the psyche or the mind, is completely different to the body. It's not a machine. It's, it doesn't obey the laws of physics. It isn't explicable in terms of atoms and molecules. It is something else. It's an immaterial aspect of our experience. And humans supposedly, are those two kinds of thing in one person. And, and he summed it up in his phrase in Latin, deus ex machina, which means roughly God in the machine or soul in the machine. And that is a very, you know, that's a very fundamental philosophy for Western medicine because, and frankly, it's underpinned many of the great successes of Western medicine to think about the body as a machine, to think about ultimately How is a disease caused? How is a disease like, let's say, tuberculosis caused? There is an infection of the machine, the, the body machine, by this bacterium. You know, it proliferates, it causes the symptoms of disease and so on. By understanding it mechanically and physically, we've got a great deal more understanding about tuberculosis and how to treat it 
than we did several hundred years ago. And there are many other, you know, Western medicine has produced many extraordinary advances and benefits to us all as a result of thinking about the body as a machine. But I think it's been a much less successful philosophical position for understanding and treatment of psychological symptoms. Because if you buy into that dualist idea, then a symptom like depression or you know any other psychological symptom actually must be understood in its own terms. It can't be related very clearly to the body machine because originally in, in Descartes' view, they, they were completely different kinds of thing. And I think that dualist split is very entrenched in Western medicine, certainly in this country. You know, if you've got physical symptoms, if you've got pain in your joints, for example, you've got a problem with the body machine, you'll go and see physicians who are trained in one kind of way, in a certain kind of hospital. If you've got psychological symptoms of depression, for example, you'll probably end up seeing a different type of doctor, a psychiatrist, who may be working in a different kind of hospital. There's a very, there's a very organizational and professional um, distinction between psychological and physical symptoms in medicine, very deeply ingrained. In the book, I call it medical apartheid, which is quite a strong phrase. But I think it does reflect a very rigid segregation between mental and physical health symptoms that is very ingrained in Western medicine. And I think that is one reason why people have found it difficult to believe that inflammation in the body could have effects on the mind like depression. But I also think that the, the world is changing a bit. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Berlin Wall in the brain. And, you know, when I was at medical school, which was around about the mid 1980s, we were told, as a matter of fact, that the body, the inflammation in the body, could have n nothing to do with the brain and nothing to do with the mind because there was something called the blood brain barrier, which sit was situated between the body and the brain and prevented inflammatory proteins and inflammatory cells from getting out of the out of the blood and into the brain it was a bit like a berlin wall in the sense that it was a very you know rigid partition between um the body and the brain and you know it was a it was taught as a piece of physiology but it was also, of course, consistent with this underlying philosophy of dualism, of a split between body and mind. And one of the very interesting things to me, and one of the things I personally find rather delightful, is that um, over the last several years, it's become clear due to new science that the blood-brain barrier is nothing like the Berlin Wall, really. It's much more permeable to communication. There's much more uh, exchange of information all the time between the immune system in the body and and the nervous system on the other hand and in the book i say you know since the 1980s the wall in berlin has come down and so too has the berlin wall in the brain and we know no, we no longer have that sort of very concrete concept of of a, a partition between body and brain in terms of this blood-brain barrier, that is no longer a, it's no longer the same concept as it was in the 1980s. It's much more permeable, and that allows us to think a lot more freely about how body and mind could be joined up in a more integrated understanding of both physical and mental health symptoms. Absolutely, and could I introduce an idea here, which I mean, we need to remind ourselves that Descartes was considered, at least by by some of his contemporaries, to be a heretic um, yes. because he was so bold as to conjure up this idea of dualism in response to what was until then very much under the dogma of Christianity and integrity of the body, even to do research on a body was impossible because this was um, heresy and you had to be very bold to do this. And from there, the idea of 
the dualism, so the soul, especially the soul, being confined to a different part, and therefore you you find a way of arguing yourself out of this threat even to your life, which many of the scientists or the early scientists had to endure. So Descartes, he was a scientist in the way that he tried to he tried to make sense of things. Mm. He tried to describe and observe things by way of developing a model, but it wasn't the truth. His adversaries in the church, they were claiming to be in possession of truth, and Descartes mm. was very bold against this. So this concept of science being equivalent of the truth is, I think, very detrimental to achieving progress because what is science essentially it is trying to make observations about we cannot explain in a way which can be replicated and therefore be foundations for assumptions on how to proceed further isn't it mm. yes absolutely no you're right you're you're very i agree with what you say and it's um it is very important to remember the historical context in all of this and yeah. you know at the time that Descartes was working you're right you know the the hegemony, if I can put it that way, of Christianity in, in Western cultures was much, much more complete than it is now. And you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, the first modern anatomy, the first, the sections of the human body had only been mm. published, you know, 50, 60 years before Descartes. And that was a very, that had been completely prohibited by religious taboo for thousands of years before the European Renaissance and you know the work of people like Vesalius were the first that was really the first modern anatomy and Descartes was bold in that context you know as far as I know I think he was also a devout Christian I mean he wasn't trying to renounce the Christianity but he was I think trying to make space for a more materialistic way of understanding some aspects of the human experience without discounting the essentially Christian idea of a, a soul. And that is roughly, I think, the, the thought process that, that led to, uh, to the dualist conception that uh, he's, he's bequeathed us. But that was 400 years ago. And mm -hmm. it was in a very different you know, historical, cultural context. And now I think we're in a situation, certainly in this country and, and perhaps in Western medicine more generally, where we still organized and our thoughts are still to some extent constrained by that dualist idea but you know the historical context which informed Descartes original formulation of dualism is completely completely changed and 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 I think it does, it is timely now just to say why do we still have this idea that bodily inflammation can't cause a mental state like depression, you know, is that is that because of a lack of sort of scientific evidence in the normal sense, or is it because perhaps we're a little bit suffering from a blind spot, a Cartesian blind spot? We can't see that that could be a, a meaningful connection because our thoughts have been a little bit overly constrained by this this old philosophical idea that remains very current in terms of Western medical thinking. Absolutely. And it is a fascinating discussion we are having now. It could go on and on. Uh, I mm. need to be respectful of your time, but just to give one more thought into this. You, you say yet that you're not going as far as to say that every depression is caused by inflammation, if I understand you correctly, mm -hmm. but that even those conditions who uh, are associated and even, I think, accepted as being possible causes for depression, for example, abuse, physical or psychological, which can cause or lead to uh, depression. This, in the work of uh, other scientists, has also been shown to have effects or can have effects that one can measure in terms of inflammation. For example, mm -hmm. Gabo Mate, he has been working long time on those effects on abuse, um, child abuse, but also um, other forms of distress. And he, if I understand him, he also says that this can be measured even in terms of inflammatory processes uh, which are triggered by those uh, traumatic events. Is this something you could 
uh, envision? Yeah. yeah. So I think um, let, let me sort of answer in two parts. So the first point you make is that this is inflammation is not necessarily going to explain every case of depression. I think that's a very important point. I think it's one going back to the question of why we haven't seen more therapeutic advances in depression in the last 20 years. I think that that's part of the explanation that we've tended to th assume that depression is one thing, you know, that everybody with depression is depressed for the same reason. And therefore, we can hope to discover a treatment that's going to work as a sort of a magic bullet, a panacea to make everybody less depressed, to make the whole world happy. Well, that's fine thought, but I think it's completely unrealistic. And I don't think it's very useful for us to think of depression as being one thing. I, I imagine that there are a number of different ways by which people can be depressed. And maybe inflammation is going to be an important story, an important explanation for depression in let's say, well, currently I would guess about a third of patients with clinical depression might have an inflammatory component. So that's important. We're not talking about everything. We're talking about a subgroup of patients with depression. But crucially, this is a subgroup that we can identify with a blood test or some other kind of biological test. You know, we can, we can do, we can measure inflammatory proteins in the blood a lot, lot more easily than we can measure serotonin in the brain, for example. So we can hope to be able to develop tests that we can use to say, when a patient comes to see me with depression, instead of me automatically just writing a, a prescription for Prozac or some other antidepressant drug on the assumption that one size fits all, in the future, I imagine physicians and psychiatrists will be saying, okay, it's interesting, you're depressed. I wonder if that could have, have anything to do with your immune system, let's do a blood test and check to see whether you might be inflamed. And that could take a treatment off into some different directions. Maybe some anti-inflammatory interventions would be more effective for people that are depressed and have that blood test evidence for inflammation as a possible cause. That's the way I would imagine the future unfolding. And that would be a great thing for psychiatry, in my opinion. It's kind of, it's the way that uh, most other areas of medicine have made progress, and I, I, I hope that it's something that we'll see coming forward in psychiatry uh, in the next, you know, ten, twenty years or so. The other point that you made is around stress, and to me, this is very fascinating, deeply fascinating in many at many levels, because okay, if you buy the idea that some people who are depressed are inflamed and that could be the cause of their depression, you know, one of the next questions you might have is, well, where does that inflammation come from? What is, you know, how do they get inflamed before they become depressed? And we've known for a long time that actually the single biggest predictive factor for depression is stress, social stress. You know, people say about 80% of depression is predictable by social stress, and that could be a major stress like losing employment, losing your spouse. It could be some other kind of stress, the chronic stress, for example, of caring for a relative, an elderly or frail relative is a, is a very stressful experience. Some occupations are very stressful. Teaching, for example, is well recognized as a particularly stressful occupation for some people. So there's those chronic adult stresses. And then, of course, there are the stresses of childhood, you know, being exposed to poverty, or abuse as a child, or losing your parents, or, or even one parent as a child, a massively stressful event. We've known that these are all predictors of depression. What is now emerging scientifically, and I think is very interesting, is that they are also often triggers of inflammation. So, for example, just sticking with child abuse or child adversity as an example, there was a very interesting study done in New Zealand, actually, to show that children who had experience of abuse or adversity were much more likely to be inflamed, to have increased levels of inflammatory proteins in their blood as adults. Why do I think that's important? Well, because, first of all, it opens up a whole new sort of 
way of joining our thinking about mental health together a bit more. You know, usually as a psychiatrist now, you people are often sort of split into the the people that think that we should focus on the social factors, and that would of course include stress that can cause depression that we know can predict depression. And then there are the kind of more biologically orientated people that would would think, well, it doesn't really matter what social stresses might have caused the depression. Maybe we can anyway treat it with a drug like Prozac that's going to have an effect on the body. And there's a bit of a split there again. And I think the evidence that stress can drive inflammation, inflammation can drive depression. I find that very intriguing, not least because it gives us a way of getting to a more joined up integrative understanding of the whole problem. You know, it's not just stress. It's not just inflammation. It's how the these and other elements come together to explain depression that's going to be important in the long run. And I think another attractive consequence of understanding more about how stress drives inflammation is that it could help us and this is very, you know, um, this is getting very futuristic, sort of specul- speculative. But you know, you wonder could that help us predict which children that have been exposed to abuse or adversity or poverty, which of them are most likely to have mental health problems in later life? Can we can we predict that based on the inflammatory response to stress in a way that we can imagine? Maybe the immune system has a memory of early social stress in the same way that we know that the, or roughly the same way that we know the immune system has a memory of early biological stress. If you're exposed to an infection as a, as a child, your immune system will have a memory of that as an adult. Maybe it's also the case that if you're exposed to a social threat, like losing both your parents in childhood, maybe your immune system has a memory of that, which puts you at greater risk of inflammation and depression in later life. Um, If we could work all that out and understand it more deeply, I think that would be a huge sort of conceptual advance for our understanding of mental health. But I think it would also be a platform for which, on which we could make much better predictions of who was at most risk based on stress exposures in the past, who was at most risk in future of of mental health problems coming up in the future, and that would potentially give us a better opportunity to prevent mental health disorders rather than simply treating them once they've occurred. Professor Albert Bulmer, this has been a huge pleasure to have this discussion with you. Thank you very much for your time. Again, this was Professor Albert Bulmer at Vitalstock blog talking about his book The Inflamed Mind, due to be released in German in early March. The title will be Die Entzündete Seele, which is a literal translation of the original title. Thank you very much, Professor Bulmer. All the best to you. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and thanks for inviting me to your blog. All the best to you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.